Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're talking about fast growing spring vegetables that are perfect for first time gardeners looking for a quick win. So let's dig in because I know that as a new gardener you might be wondering what to start planting and when to start planting. One of my best friends is starting her garden for the first time this year and she's just dying to get out there and plan absolutely everything but equally you might be one of those gardeners that's looking at bare soil and wondering how to make it look a little bit better to stop the neighbors twittering about the mess i hear you uh, actually unfortunately my neighbor passed away and uh, the people selling the house um well it's either the the people selling the house or people looking to buy the house either way they keep putting their heads over the fence like i've got a six foot privacy fence so they're climbing on stuff in that yard to look over is that a thing here that seems a little nosy to me, but maybe that's just my English upbringing coming out. Anyway, either way, my garden's a bit of a mess still. And in the midst of um, a big cleanup, since we've had a few other things going on over um, the last few weekends, but definitely clearing out stuff from the winter in the garden and planting up the garden beds goes a long way to make things look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. And of course, spring is a really weird time of year, right? You've got frost that are clinging on, rain can put a damper on some of your homestead activities. You might even still be getting flurries of snow where i live in utah we've hardly had any snow and rain this year so i'm planning um my garden for little water this year so i'm pretty sure they're going to be putting in some water restrictions so i've actually got to reevaluate my garden plans a little bit to see if i've got any um, drought tolerant varieties that i can switch to or maybe add in to add some diversity um, because of course that's why locally adapted seeds are really important right they've got the genetics already in there to manage through rough seasons and produce a harvest and of course more seeds and since we just celebrated earth day back in uh uh, April the 22nd um, I wanted to help you with your journey to self-sufficiency so I've opened up the doors again to the Grey Own Food Academy with a massive discount and you can get the bonus of the easy seed saving course. Uh, now this offer is only open for one week only so it's going to close on May 1st 2021. There's no membership fees, you get lifetime access and all the updates and extra content as it gets uploaded. So if you're interested in learning more, click the link in the podcast description. But remember, this offer closes on May 1st, 2021. Now, let's get into the today's content because I'm going to start you off with a quick tip for quick veggies, okay? If you have the money, then visit your local nursery or garden centre for some starter plants or transplants, okay? You're going to be looking for healthy plants that are not yellowing they don't have any funny colored spots on the leaves um, if you carefully take that plant out of the seed tray or the pot and you really should um, you want to be looking to see what the status of the roots are right you don't want the roots to be all kind of bound up in the plant right if you can all you can see is roots and no soil then that's a uh, root bound plant and it's going to be stressing out and um, the roots themselves are should be creamy white in color um, and not have kind of any kind of dying off bits on there um, you also want to take a look and see if there's any green moss or algae growing on top of the soil or in and around that plant and there definitely shouldn't be any fuzzy white moldy stuff on there if there is give those plants a miss you want to be looking for for healthy plants right and transplants are great for a super fast garden because they're already growing right you just plant them out into the garden bed add some mulch and voila you have a garden but at this time of year right you don't want to be transplanting out you know tomatoes and things like that especially if you're in some of the northern states you want to be sticking with things that are like the brassicas right cold tolerant veggies and um if you're not yet past your frost date then we're talking things like cabbage kale cauliflower those type of plants these can take a bit of the frosty weather 
So I'm going to start with those brassica crops, um, because even if you're a few weeks from your last frost date, you can sow cabbages and kale under a floating row cover or frost protection like a hoop house as far out as six to eight weeks before your last frost in spring. And some of my favorite cabbages to grow are Golden Acre and Greyhound. They're very early and they make delicious sauerkraut, by the way. Um, I also like some of the Chinese cabbage or the Napa cabbage varieties. Um, Hilton is one of my favorite. It makes really good kimchi. Um, so I love to use um, early cabbages in kind of fermented um, foodstuffs. I eat way more of those um, than I do kind of the fresh cabbages. But I do like to add cabbage to things like minestrone soups and stuff like that. But um, let's talk about kale. And I'll be honest, I freaking love kale. Uh, when I grow kale, it reminds me of my favorite aunt, who I love very much. Um, her and my uncle grew this really cool curly kale, like a scotch curly kale variety, or a Vates blue curled kale. Um, my dogs love to eat kale, um, so much so that I have to keep them out the garden whilst it's getting established, or the dogs are looking rather sheepish, which is really impressive for a border collie or an Irish wolfhound collie cross to look sheepish um, and my garden bed is now just chewed off stems um, but some of the favorite kales to grow are red russian or ragged jack since that's really tolerant of the cold weather uh, cavalo nero or dinosaur kale uh, and the Vates Blue Curled are uh, the other favourites that I like to grow. And Vates does really well, even as the temperature ramps up. So it's a good one for you to consider if you're tuning in from the southern states to grow. Now, these plants, kales and cabbages, they need room to grow. So you want to space your seeds 18 to 24 inches apart. Now, I know that seems like a lot of space, but bear with me for a mo moment, right? Um, you can sow these seeds closer, but then you're going to need to thin out the plants or remove those seedlings growing so you have, you know, your cabbages or kale 18 to 24 inches apart. Or you can sow the seeds 18 to 24 inches apart or transplant your plants 18 to 24 inches apart. And you can use that space to grow something else that's going to grow low to the ground and act like a mulch. Clover is a really great cover crop that can add nitrogen to the soil, feeding your cabbages and kale. But it isn't edible for you, the gardener. So how about lettuce instead? And if you're going to be doing this, this interplanting, then you're going to want to stick to the kind of the flatter, the loose leaf, cut and come again type of lettuces. These work really well for interplanting with cabbage. Um, you could use remains, but they tend to get a little taller and you want to have, um, you know, plenty of room for your cabbages and kales to get established, right? So that's that's why the, the lower growing ones look um, and grow really well in this type of situation. So you're looking for varieties like the Black Seeded Simpson, Bronzaro, Deer Tongue, Vulcan and the Hyper Red Rumple Waved. They're all really ideal for this type of planting. And of course, it means that you're getting more out of your garden space because you can make several baby leaf lettuce harvests as your cabbages and kales are getting established. And then when the lettuces start to bolt or send up that tall flower stalk, you can pull them out and add them to the compost heap and give your cabbages and kales a nice load of compost and some mulch. Or you can leave a few lettuces in the garden bed for seed saving, right? But lettuces for baby leaf salads can be ready to harvest in under 60 days, making them a really fast spring vegetable for you to grow. And like I said, as your cabbages and kales are getting established in that space, you are not um, not getting a harvest, right? You're able to you know, get something, get some food out of that growing space. Now, the speediest of all vegetables to grow is the humble radish. And some are ready to harvest in less than 30 days. Um, I've had many a radish top salad in my youth as well as snacking on the radish roots and I can still remember my sister and I at Big Grandad and Granny's house and we're eating fresh radishes from the garden. I even remember the taste. Um, radishes are a fond vegetable for me since they were what my granddad taught me how to sow from seed when I was little. I can't stand radishes from the grocery store mind you but a fresh French breakfast or cherry bell radish now we're talking. And radishes are part of the brassica family so they can tolerate the cooler weather in spring 
and you want to sow these seeds about two to four inches apart directly in the garden bed. They don't grow very well if they're transplanted so save yourself the headache and just sow them straight in your garden instead and um, just watch them grow right radishes are a really cool vegetable to grow if you've got other veggies that are kind of slow to germinate like um, parsnips right it's really common especially in the UK to sow your parsnip seeds and sow radishes with them so you can see the line of where your um, parsnips were sown in the garden because your radishes come up really really fast and you can see oh that's where I sowed them and, you know, mark them, especially if you're a forgetful gardener and you forgot to put out, um, you know, the stake markers and stuff where you sowed things. Uh, not that I did that a lot of the time, um, but it's a great way to use up the space, right? And use the space more efficiently to grow more food in the area that you have available. Now, let's talk a little bit about beetroots, okay? Beetroots, beets are next on my list of early spring veggies to grow. They're dark green leaves with the red ribs look very striking in the early spring vegetable garden. And you can sow seeds for beets up to four weeks before the last frost in spring, um, especially if you're doing it under some frost protection, so like a floating row cover or a hoop house, right? And you can sow seeds about five inches apart. You then want to remove the weaker looking seedlings with some scissors because what happens is with beet seeds, they sprout multiple seedlings from that one seed. So you want to take a look at those seedlings that are growing and just remove the weaker ones and you do that by grabbing some scissors and snip the seedling at the soil level and you want to leave that strongest looking seedling in place to grow into a beet and you know you don't need to waste those um, thinnings because now you have a fancy microgreen salad that's from your beet thinnings right and it's perfect in a pizza bread with some hummus or maybe make a egg sandwich a little classy with the microgreen thinnings and a bit of mustard I don't know I'm not that fancy in the kitchen <laughs> um, but beets need an even moisture to to grow so you want to mulch the garden bed really well with compost and some mulch I like to use straw or fall leaves as a mulch um, because they will eventually break down and there's plenty of beet varieties to choose from um, the bull's blood is a favorite with us um, the red leaves look really pretty. They can go in a salad when they're small, um, but they also have this really beautiful dark red beet that grows as well. Um, there are beet varieties that are grown specifically for their leaves, like Red Devil and McGregor's Favourite. I really like McGregor's Favourite beets for their roots as well, because they store really well for me in the fridge and roast up really well. So I kind of get a double benefit of being able to have, you know, a few of the smaller leaves, um, but not too many because you want to leave some leaves on there so that they can um, put some energy towards building a root. Um, um, but you can have both some of the leaves and some roots that, you know, hold up quite well to cooking. Um, golden beets are beautiful and you can get um, yellow ones. They're named golden beets, um, but also touchstone gold is a favorite. Um, I also really like the red and white stripy Chioggia, uh, which is an Italian uh, variety. But my favorite beets are deep, deep red ones. So I really like the early wonder because they have these beautiful green leaves and uh, Detroit dark red. Um, I really like the very earthy taste um, of those, which I, I understand is not to everybody's, um, you know, taste. Um, I mean, I like to drink beet juice for fun. I, I appreciate I'm probably on my own for that one. <laughs> um, but another one um, that's a very early veg to grow, um, that's also part of the beet family is Swiss chard. And that's one of the vegetables that people seem to coo over when they see it growing in the vegetable garden. Like, oh, your garden looks lovely. Um, and they say that because they see these beautiful bright green leaves and these wonderful colored stems that really make the garden pop. And, you know, Swiss chard's a really easy vegetable to grow. And, um, you know, it kind of just screams a, a garden looking healthy and vibrant which is why people seem to coo over it all the time 
Now, I really love growing Vulcan, which is a red stem variety. Plus, we're kind of Trekkies in our household. So that choice was a really easy win for me to get my husband on board with, number one, buying the seeds, uh, and number two, <laughs> trying the veggies in the kitchen. And I know that might be a deal breaker for you listening and hearing that we're Star Trek fans. So if you're not a Trekkie fan, I apologize. Um, I'm not going to make jokes about live long and prosper, I promise you. Um, but I also really like um, muted pastel shades of the five color silver beet varieties um they're kind of these kind of um st almost stripes this kind of um like a white striping in with the colors um that gives them these kind of beautiful pastel shades but you can also get very bright looking uh, swiss chard varieties and just taking a look at any seed supplier online or in a catalog and i'm sure you're going to find a variety of swiss chard that's for you because the colors span from bright white stems all the way through um to deep red so we're talking yellows oranges pinks um as well as reds. so there's going to be one that you will like the look of for sure now you want to be sowing Swiss chard seeds about 18 inches apart because they get big and they get big fast. And because Swiss chard is part of the beet family, it's going to grow a bunch of seedlings out of one seed, just like the beets are. So you're going to need to grab your trusty scissors again and snip those weaker looking seedlings to leave the strongest one in place there to grow. And of course you can use those thinnings as a fancy microgreen salad too. So this wouldn't be a chat about quick spring veggies if I didn't mention peas. Peas love cool weather and grow really well in spring. When the temperatures get hotter, peas tend to die off and you want to be sowing peas around two to four weeks before your last spring frost date and for a few weeks after the spring frost date for a successional harvest and you want to be sowing peas about three inches apart um, you might need to sow them a little bit wider if you're in a humid area so to give them plenty of airflow round um but you want to make sure you provide some trellis or kind of twiggy sticks um, as a trellis for them to grow up. And by twiggy sticks, I mean, you know, some brush or something that you've kind of been pruning off. Things that have got like lots of little bits poking off them that the little tendrils on the peas can grab onto and grow up. Um, hazel was a common one that was used in the UK. Um, but whatever you've got handy that you've been pruning out that's got a lot of bits that they can grasp on to works just fine you could also use netting um, or if you have the time you can sort of rig up um, some trellising uh, with some twine and some uh, bamboo canes um, other things that grow really well uh, or sorry that can be used um, for peas to grow up really well are things like chicken wire um, that seems to work very well for a lot of people too um, but peas definitely uh grow very very well where i live in utah and sugar and peas are ones that i never get to enjoy because my hubby seems to snaffle them all before i get a chance um but they're a good sugar snap pea variety so i'm told by him uh they're the jokes on him this year because i'm growing shelling peas um like the purple potted king tut which is amazingly productive by the way um and i'm also growing compass which is also a good drying pea for soup and I really like pea soup. Um, my friends in the southern states tell me that the Oregon Sugar Pod 2 is an exceptional producer for them from uh, February before the heat sets in. So if you're tuning in from the deep south consider those for your first garden. Now I'm obviously a sucker for the English pea varieties for nostalgia so I do like to grow um, the shelling pea varieties like Green Arrow, Tall Telephone, Progress Number no. 9, Alderman and Calverdon Wonder. Um, those were ones that were popular to grow in the UK and I absolutely loved having them freshly shelled and steamed with a sprig of mint and that's definitely a spring favourite way to eat them in the UK. Um, Alderman is one that I keep looking out for 
because it's an old Victorian variety and it produces really heavy crops with big pods. So if you see it here in the US, please let me know um, because it's one that I love to grow back in the UK and I've not been able to find it here so far. Um, Wando is a really good shelling pea for the south and Little Marvel Dwarf Shelling Pea is a dependable variety to grow as well. Now I will say that birds absolutely love the pea leaves growing so this year I'm going to be hanging old CDs around the pea plants to help deter the birds and uh, I'm going to be moving the bird feeders to another area of the garden to try and distract them away from the peas um, because what I found is the birds are kind of pecking on the pea leaves all the time and then my peas are not as productive because they're trying to overcome the damage that's happening from the birds. Now the CDs work by um, dangling them down on some string or whatever they're going to be moving around and the light's going to be flashing from the sun uh, from the CD so that helps to deter them and if it's not the light flashing that's going to deter them then I'm pretty sure they're going to be feeling the same way about the Spice Girls and other childhood favourites and keep well away. So if you found some cringeworthy classics hiding in your music stash that you are too embarrassed to admit that you like then maybe consider put the, putting them out in the garden to deter the birds from your pea plants so this was a really quick episode because i know that you're super busy and you're wanting to get outside and get on with things on your homestead so let me know in the facebook group what your favorite fast growing veggies are and don't forget to grab your access to the grow your own food academy and the easy seed saving bonus before the offer ends on may the 1st 2021 until next time i hope your garden grows beautifully and i'll see you all next week